Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 23, Heretics, Book 5, Heretics from Secret Societies of All Ages, Volume 1 by Charles William Heckethorn. Book 5, Heretics. The heretic foxes have various faces, but they all hang together by their tails. Pope Gregory 9. 1. Heretics, 168. Transition from ancient to modern initiations. An order of facts now claims our attention, which in a certain manner signalizes the transition from ancient to modern initiations. An extraordinary phenomenon in social conditions becomes apparent, so strikingly different from what we meet with in antiquity, as to present itself as a new starting point. Hitherto we have seen the secret organizing itself in the higher social classes, so as to deprive the multitude of truths, whose revelation could not have taken place without injury and danger to the hierarchy. At the base, we find polytheism, superstition. At the summit, deism, rationalism, the most abstract philosophy. 169, spirit of ancient and modern secret societies. The secret societies of antiquity were theological and theology frequently inculcated superstition. But in the deepest recesses of the sanctuary, there was a place where it would laugh at itself and the deluded people and draw to itself the intelligences that rebelled against the servitude of fear by initiating them into the only creed worthy of a free man. To that theology, therefore, otherwise very learned and not cruel and which promoted art and science, much may be forgiven, attributing perhaps not to base calculation but to sincere conviction and thoughtful prudence the dissimulation with which it concealed the treasures of truth and knowledge that formed its power, glory, and in a certain manner, its privilege. In modern times, the high religious and political spheres have no secrets, for they have no privilege of knowledge nor initiation which confer on those higher in knowledge the right to sit on the seat of the mighty, and no one without being guilty of an anachronism and preparing for himself bitter disappointments can seek the truth where there is but a delusive show of it. Whoever persists in making any fictitious height the object of his ambition, removes his eyes from the horizon which lit up by the dawn, casts light around his feet, while his head is yet in darkness. Henceforth, secret societies are popular and religious, not in the sense of the constituted and official church, but of a rebellious and sectarian church. And since at a period when the authority of the church is paramount, and religion circulates through all the veins of the state, no change can be effected without heresy, so this must necessarily be the first aspect of political and intellectual revolt. This heresy makes use of the denial and rejection of official dogmas in order to overthrow the hated clerocracy and to open for itself a road to civil freedom. 170. The Circumcellions. The papacy was necessarily the first cradle of the new conspirators, who at an early date arose out of it. In the second century, the Adamites became conspicuous. They asserted that by Christ's death, they were as innocent as Adam before the fall and were accused of praying naked in their assemblies. We may incidentally mention that the sect was renewed in the 15th century by one Picard, a native of Flanders. But a more important sect which arose in the first century of Christianity was that of the Circumcellions, who were a branch of the Donatists, the followers of Donatus, the schismatic Bishop of Carthage, AD 311, who at that early age already preached against the corruptions of the Romish Church. By the violent persecution they experienced, some of the bishop's adherents were turned into fanatics, and bands of them roamed about the country, hence their name, compounded of Circumcellos preaching reformation and redressing grievances, setting free slaves and remitting debts without consulting the parties most interested and occasionally committing greater crimes. Some of these fanatics, in a mistaken zeal for martyrdom, threw themselves down precipices, leapt into the fire or cut their own throats. The sect existed some 13 or 14 years when it was suppressed by the magistracy. A heretical sect bearing the same name existed also in the 12th and 13th centuries in Germany denying the authority of popes, bishops, and priests, and the legality of ecclesiastical interdicts. 171. The Albigenses. One of the most extensive and active heresies was that of the Albigenses, so called after their chief town, Albi, 
whence they spread all over southern France. The sect was the offspring of Manichaeism. It fructified in its turn the germs of the Templars and Rosicrucians, and of all those associations that continued the struggle and fought against ecclesiastical and civil oppression. 172. Objects of the Albigenses It is to be noticed that the object of the Albigenses in so far differed from that of all posterior sects, that its blows were intended for Papal Rome alone, and wholly Papal was the revenge taken through the civil arm and with priestly rage. The Albigenses were the Ghibellines of France and combined with all who were opposed to Rome, especially with Frederick II and the Aragonese in maintaining the rights of kings against the pretensions of the Papal See. Their doctrines had a special influence on the University of Bologna, wholly imperial. Dante was imperialistic, tainted with that doctrine, and therefore hated by the Guelphs. 173. Tenets of the Albigenses. Toulouse was the Rome of that church, which had its pastors, bishops, provincial and general councils, like the official church, and assembled under its banners the dissenters of a great portion of Europe, all meditating the ruin of Rome and the restoration of the kingdom of Jerusalem. The rising in Provence gathered strength from the circumstances in which it took place. The Crusaders had revived Eastern Manichaeism, placing Europe in immediate contact with sophisticated Greece, with Mohammedan and pantheistic Asia. The East, moreover, contributed Aristotle and his Arab commentators, to which must be added the subtleties of the Kabbalah and the materialism of ideas. Philosophy, republicanism and industry assailed the Holy See. Various isolated rebellions had revealed the general spirit and wholesale slaughter had not repressed it. The rationalism of the Waldenses, so-called after Peter Waldo, the founder of the sect, connected itself with the German mysticism of the Rhine and the Netherlands, where the operatives rose against the counts and the bishops. Every apostle that preached pure morality, the religion of the spirit, the restoration of the primitive church, found followers. The century of Louis IX, or the saint, 1226 through 1270, is the century of unbelief in the Church of Rome, and the impossibilia of Siguero foreshadowed those of Strauss. 174. Aims of the Albigenses. The heresy of the Albigenses made such progress along the shores of the Mediterranean that several countries seemed to separate from Rome, while princes and emperors openly favored it. Not satisfied with already considering impious Rome overthrown, the Albigenses suddenly turned towards the Crusaders, at first looked at with indifference, hoping to make Jerusalem the glorious and powerful rival of Rome, there to establish the seat of the Albigenses, to restore the love of religion in its first home, to found on earth the heavenly Jerusalem of which Godfrey of Bouillon was proclaimed king. This was the man who had carried fire and sword into Rome, slain the 15th of October 1080, the anti-Caesar Rodolphe, the king elected by priests and thrust the Pope out of the holy city, deserving thereby and by the hopes entertained of him the infinite praises for his piety, purity and chastity bestowed on him by the troubadours who originally appeared in the first quarter of the 12th century in the allegorical compositions known by the name of the Knight of the Swan. The project of making Jerusalem the rival of Rome assigned an important part to the Templars, who perhaps were aware of and sharers in it. 175. The Qatari. Italy, though watched by Rome, nay, because watched, supported the new doctrines. Milan was one of the most active foci of the Qatari, the pure. In 1166, that city was more heretical than Catholic. In 1150, there were Cathari at Florence, and the women especially were most energetic in the dissemination of the dogmas of the sect, which became so powerful as to effect in the city a revolution in favor of the Ghibellines. At Orvieto, Catharism prevailed in 1125 and was persecuted in 1163. The persecution was most fierce at Verona, Ferrara, Modena, etc. In 1224, a great number of these sectaries met in Calabria and Naples, and even Rome was full of them but Lombardy and Tuscany were always the chief seats of this revolt. A 176 doctrines and tenets, but we have only scanty notices of this sect because unlike other heretical associations, it sought to conceal its operations. It bore great resemblance to Manichaeism and the dogmas of the Albigenses, 
like which latter it concealed its doctrines not only from the world at large, but even from its proselytes of inferior degrees. They believed in the metempsychosis, assuming that to attain to the light, seven such transmigrations were required. But as in other cases, this was probably an emblematic manner of speaking of the degrees of initiation. They attributed the origin of the visible and of the invisible world to different creators. The former was the creation of the evil spirit, wherefore they rejected the Old Testament account of the creation as also the incarnation of Christ, purgatory, hell, etc. They had communistic tendencies and were averse to marriage. Philanthropists, above all, they led industrious lives, combined saving habits with charity, founded schools and hospitals, crossed lands and seas to make proselytes, denied to magistrates the right of taking away life, did not disapprove of Tiasuis, and preceded the Templars in the contempt of the cross. They could not understand how Christians could adore the instrument of the death of the Savior, and said that the cross was the figure of the beast mentioned in the apocalypse and an abomination in a holy place. They performed their ceremonies in woods, caverns, remote valleys, Wherefore, those belonging to this heresy and others deriving from it could well answer the question, where did our ancient brethren meet before there were any lodges? In every place. They were accused of strangling or starving the dying and of burning children. Charges also brought against the Mithraics, Christians, Gnostics, Jews, and quite recently against the Irish Roman Catholics. The accusation, as in the other cases, probably arose from some symbolical sacrifice literally interpreted by their opponents. They had four sacraments, and the consolation consisted in the imposition of hands or baptism of the Holy Spirit, which bestowed only on adults remitted sins, imparted the consoling spirit, and secured eternal salvation. During persecutions, the ceremonies were shortened and were held at night and secretly. The lighted tapers symbolized the baptism of fire. At the ceremony of initiation, the priest read the first 18 verses of the Gospel of St. John, a custom still practiced in some Masonic degrees. In remembrance of his initiation, the novice received a garment made of fine linen and wool, which he wore under his shirt, the women a girdle, which they also wore next to the skin just under the bosom. 177. Persecution of the Cathari. The following may suffice as an instance of the persecution to which the Cathari were subject in those religious days. Dolcino, the leader of a sect of the Cathari, who called themselves the Apostolic because they endeavored to restore the Christianity of the Apostles, and who predicted the downfall of the then already most corrupt papacy, was pursued by the Inquisition, 1307. With 1,400 of his followers, Dolcino took refuge on a hill in the district of Vercelli, but the apostolic were taken. Dolcino and his wife Margaret were torn to pieces, limb by limb, by order of the Holy Fathers, and the pieces afterwards burnt by the public executioner, against such of the followers of Dolcino as had not been seized with their leader. Clement V ordered a crusade, granting plenary absolution to all who took part in it. Fifteen years after Dolcino's death, 30 of his disciples were burnt alive on the marketplace at Padua. 178. The Waldenese or Vaudois. This sect arose in the 12th century and was so named after its founder, Peter Waldus, a rich citizen of Lyon. Its aims were, to a great extent, similar to those of the Albigenses. Persecuted by the church, its members spread over a great part of Europe. In the 13th century, the Pope instituted a crusade against them, the details of which belong to general history. The principles of the Vaudois, however, remained unsubdued and at the Reformation their descendants were reckoned among the Protestants, though they differed and continue to differ from them in many doctrinal points, and they remain as a distinct sect in many parts of Europe. But it was only in 1848 that by the edict of the King of Sardinia, they were granted religious liberty and equal civil and political rights with the Roman Catholic population of that kingdom. According to Ruhlman Merswin, who wrote between 1370 to 80 at Strasbourg, a community of Vaudois then lived hidden in the mountains of Switzerland, calling themselves by the name of Friends of God. The Anabaptists, Lollards, Begards, and Beguines all sprang from this sect. 179 Luciferians. Another sect which sprung from the Qatari was that of the Luciferians. 
which must not be confounded with that so named after Lucifer, Bishop of Cagliari, and which existed for a short time under Theodosius the Great. The Luciferians, or devil worshippers to be spoken of here, arose in the 12th or 13th century. Their chief seats were in the Principality of East Friesland. The Frieslanders, having refused to pay tithes to the Archbishops of Bremen, they were proclaimed heretics. Conrad von Marburg, infamous for hypocrisy and cruelty, took the part of the Church, and nothing shows the mental besottedness of the clergy of those days better than the report sent to the Pope Gregory IX and adopted by this latter as a true statement of facts, as is apparent from his bull, published in 1233. According to Conrad's report, as reproduced in the Pope's bull, the Luciferians, when initiating a candidate, first caused a frog or toad to appear to him, which he had to kiss or to draw its tongue and saliva into his own mouth. This animal usually appeared in its natural size, sometimes as large as a goose, but more generally as large as a baker's oven. Then a pale man, consisting of only skin and bone, appeared to the novice who had to kiss him, after which the novice lost all recollection of the Catholic faith. A black tomcat then descended through a statue, which was always found in the meeting place of these heretics. And when they all had kissed the animal's hinder quarters, the lights were extinguished and the most licentious practices indulged in. The candles having been relighted, a man appeared, more glorious than the sun in his upper parts, while the lower part of his body resembled that of a cat, who received a piece of cloth torn off the novice's clothes as a pledge that henceforth the new initiate belonged to him. These heretics further said that God unjustly cast Lucifer into hell but that eventually the devil would be restored to his former glory and happiness. 180. Origin of Devil Worship Now it is certain that in the Dark Ages, when men were crushed under superstition and cruelty, when cleric and secular oppressors, the former the worst of the two, rendered life almost unbearable to the serf and the bondsman, these, seeing themselves forsaken by God and his saints, naturally appealed to the devil for protection and hence a kind of devil worship arose. Wherefore we may accept the charge brought against the Luciferians of believing in the devil's eventual restoration as true. Nor is it a serious one. Very pious people such as the everlasting gospelers held that belief. But the other charges are too absurd to require serious refutation. We are told that the Luciferians had their signs of recognition and used to accost one another thus. Lucifer, who has been wronged, greets thee. To prevent an uninitiated to enter their assemblies, they would put the question, do thorns prick today? The answer to which is not recorded, but of course was known to the initiated only. The places where they held their meetings were called cellars of repentance. The charge of committing unnatural crimes brought against them was one brought by the church against all heretics. But the Luciferians were not so accused till late in the 13th century, when the sect had ceased to exist, having been exterminated by the word and fire of Holy Mother Church. There existed numerous other sects, named either after their founders or the localities in which they arose, such as the Messalians, the Bogomiles, supposed to be sprung from the latter, the Canians, the Oncrophites, and others, yet none of them were of such importance as those spoken of above. But whatever might be their determination, the members of all these sects in the course of several centuries supplied many victims to the torture chambers and faggots of the Inquisition, the Church cunningly mixing up heresy with witchcraft. Thomas Stapleton, who, during the reign of Queen Elizabeth, emigrated to Holland to escape the persecution of the Roman Catholics in this country, wrote a book on the question why clergy and witchcraft spread simultaneously to such an extent which two evils he called the twin children of the devil. The author died in 1598. Even after this date, it was damnable heresy to deny the existence of witchcraft. In 1725, the Principality of Hohenzollern Hetchingen in Württemberg by public decree promised five florins reward to anyone bringing in, dead or alive, a goblin nixie or other spook of the kind. 181. Religion of the Troubadours. Troubadours and Albigenses drew closer together in persecution. Their friendship increased in the school of sorrow. They sang and fought for one another, and their songs expired on the blazing piles. Wherefore, it appears reasonable to consider the Troubadours as the organizers of that vast conspiracy directed against the Church of Rome, 
the champions of a revolt which had not for its guide an object material interests and vulgar ambition, but a religion and a polity of love. Here love is considered not as an affection which all more or less experience and understand, but as an art, a science, acquired by means of the study and practice of sectarian rites and laws, and the artists under various names appear scattered throughout many parts of Europe. It is difficult indeed to determine the boundaries within which the gay science was diffused. The singers of love are met with as the troubadours of the long dock and the long doui, the minnesangers and minstrels. 182. Difficulty to understand the troubadours. The singers of Provence, whose language was by the popes called the language of heresy, are nearly unintelligible to us, and we know not how to justify the praises bestowed upon their poetry by such men as Dante, Petrarch, Chaucer. Nor dare we, since we do not understand their verses, call their inspiration madness, nor deny them the success they undoubtedly achieved. It appears more easy and natural to think that those free champions of a heresy who were not permitted clearly to express their ideas preferred the obscure turns of poetry and light forms that concealed their thoughts, as the sumptuous and festive courts of love perhaps concealed the lodges of the Albigenses from the eye of the Papal Inquisition. The same was done for political purposes at various periods. Thus, we have Gringor's La Chasse du Cerf de Cerf, a pun designating Pope Julius II by allusion to the service Servorum, in which that Pope is held up to ridicule. But some of the troubadours, such for instance as Walter von der Vogelweide, D. 1228, and Peter Cardinal, D. 1306, sang openly against the abuses of the church and the corrupt lives of the clergy. 183. Poetry of Troubadours. Arnaldo Daniel was obscure even for his contemporaries. According to the monk of Montaudon, no one understands his songs. And yet Dante and Petrarch praise him above every other Provencal poet, calling him the great master of love, perhaps a title of sectarian dignity, and extolling his style, which they would not have done had they not been able to decipher his meaning. The effusions of the troubadours were always addressed to some lady, though they dared not reveal her name. What Hugo de Brunet says applies to all. If I be asked to whom my songs are addressed, I keep it a secret. I pretend to such a one, but it is nothing of the kind. The mistress invoked, there can be no doubt, like Dante's Beatrice, was the purified religion of love, personified as the Virgin Sophia. 184. Degrees among troubadours, there were four degrees, but the romance of the rose divides them into four and three, producing again the mystic number seven. This poem describes a castle surrounded with a sevenfold wall which is covered with emblematical figures and no one was admitted into the castle that could not explain their mysterious meaning. The troubadours also had their secret signs of recognition and the minstrels are supposed to have been so called because they were the ministers of a secret worship. 185. Courts of Love. I've already alluded to these. They probably gave rise to the lodges of adoption, the knights and nymphs of the rose, etc. The degrees pronounced therein with pedantic proceedings literally interpreted are frivolous or immoral and therefore incompatible with the morals and manners of the Albigenses, which were on the whole pure and austere. The courts of love may therefore have concealed far sterner objects than the decision of questions of mere gallantry. And it is noticeable that these courts, as well as the race of troubadours, became extinct with the extinction of the Albigenses by the sword of de Montfort and the faggots of the Inquisition. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment and if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.